Good evening. Truly, we are thankful to the God in heaven once again uh, for your presence being with us on tonight. Uh, thankfully, um, as you all know, um, I have been preaching for some time now, not a long time, but uh, just for a little while now. And each sermon as preachers that we preach, well, first of all, let me say this, I've also come to realize the longer uh, I preach and the more I preach, I've come to realize that as preachers, we struggle uh, just like everyone else. And I've come to realize that more often than not, when we're struggling with something, uh, everybody's struggling with something. Or more often than not, that when we have an issue in our lives, uh, hopefully with the word of God, we are able to get through those things and ultimately being able to preach about it and make an impact on all those who listen to us. About a year and a half ago, I was going through a very rough time in life. And so the sermon tonight is in any way not just about me, but of course it's a small scene from my life. And hopefully tonight, uh, as we look at Exodus chapter 17, we all can take some application and we all can be better for it. Because that's why we're here tonight, uh, to be better uh, and to get better by listening and by following the word of God. In Exodus chapter 17, tonight we're going to be talking about trusting God in dry places. Again, trusting God in dry places. A little bit of the history tonight. If you remember in Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 9 there, the Bible says, There arose a new Pharaoh which knew not Joseph. And the implication there being clear, he knew who Joseph was, uh, but he didn't care. He was going to do what he wanted to do in regards of Egypt. And so the Bible there says he uh, charged them and he commanded that they were going to be made slaves. In Exodus chapter 3, if you remember there, Moses flees Egypt and he goes down to Midian where he's going to meet a man by the name of Jethro where eventually he's going to marry his daughter, uh, that being Zipporah. In Exodus chapter 3 as well, God calls Moses, if you will, and God tells Moses, I need you to go back to Egypt. And if you remember, Moses gives all these excuses as to why he could not go back to Egypt. Well, you know what, God? I'm not a man of eloquent, uh, of, of eloquent speech. And God said in response to that, well, okay, I'm going to give you Aaron. And then Moses said, well, you know what, God? I'm, I'm really not suitable for this. And God said, I'll give you everything you need. And eventually Moses said, well, you know what, God? Just send somebody else. And so in Exodus 5, 1 and 2, the Bible says, and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and they told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Exodus 5, verse 2, the Bible says, Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. As a result of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, God is going to strike Egypt down with a series of ten different plagues. In Exodus chapter 12, after the death of the firstborn, uh, Pharaoh told all of them they had his permission to leave Egypt. We get over to Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 15, and the Bible says they come in front of the Red Sea. In Exodus 14, verse 15, there Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. A lot of good preaching has come out of Exodus 14, verse 15. Let's stand still and let's wait on God. But I find that so interesting because the very next verse, God tells Moses, well, who told you to stand still? God said, I want you to go forward. And the Bible says Moses, with the rod of God in his hand, he divided the Red Sea in millions. The Bible says they walked in on dry ground. Now they're making their way to Sinai's mountain. And in Exodus chapter 16, they cry out to Moses and they say, well, Moses, we're hungry. And so, God, and so Moses talks to God, and God feeds them with what is it, or he feeds them with manna from heaven. And Exodus 17 and verse 2, Exodus 16, that is again, here they are once again murmuring and complaining against God again. Here they just seen a miracle. They walk in on dry ground, and immediately they begin murmuring and complaining against God and Aaron, or God and Moses, which brings us to Exodus chapter 17. God here brings them to Rephidim, and again, we'll talk about that tonight. In Exodus chapter 17, again, the Bible says they come to this place that is called Rephidim. Now, Rephidim is this desert-type place. Rephidim, again, was just a small place they were going to stay as they made their way to Sinai's mountain. In Exodus chapter 17, in verse number 1, 
the Bible records for us tonight. And all the children of the Israel, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journey from the wilderness of sin after their journeys. According to the commandment of the Lord, and the Bible says, there they camped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Over, over in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 and verse 3 there to be, uh, to be exact, as they are, again, receiving the law from God, that being the second generation, in Deuteronomy 8, verse number 2 and verse 3 there, the Bible says, or I guess here's a better question, what is God trying to do with me, or what is God trying to teach me as I am, paraphrasing, going through my wilderness experience? In Deuteronomy 8, verse number 1, the Bible says, And all the commandments which I command thee this, this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which I swear unto your fathers. Verse 2, he says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. What is God trying to do? First of all, God is trying to humble us. Second of all, God is trying to prove us or test us. And then third of all, the Bible says God wants to know what is in thine heart. So as you look at Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 3, what is God trying to get me to realize or what is God trying to teach me while I'm in my wilderness experience? First of all, God has to humble us. Many of us are so busy climbing in life, we don't have any time for God. Many of us in life are trying our hardest to achieve and to get somewhere, and those things are not wrong, any of themselves. But when we try to do so much achieving and we forget the fact that God woke us up, God has to humble us. Sometimes, again, we're so busy trying to go to the next level. We're so busy trying to make a lot of money out of life, and God says, hold on, wait a minute. God says, I'm the one who's giving you life. I'm the one who's allowing you to breathe. I'm the one who's giving you the strength to do all those great things. How dare many live their life and never turn around and tell God thank you. Tonight, originally, we were going to preach from Luke chapter 17, 11 down to verse 19, entitled, uh, The Nine Men Who Miss Thanksgiving. If you remember there, the Bible says Jesus cleansed ten lepers. And the Bible says only one came back. And the Bible says in verse 15 and 16, he decided to glorify God. What happened to the nine? And then it's so easy sometimes to say, well, you know what? In that text, I'm the one who would have went back and said thank you. But not all the time. Sometimes we're included into the nine. Sometimes we forget all the stuff and all the things God has constantly and God continuously to do for us. As I'm in this wilderness experience, God has to humble me. But second of all, God has to test me. Sometimes when we think or sometimes we believe that because we're going through something, we believe that we have done something to upset God. Just because you're going through something doesn't mean you did something to upset God. The Bible talks about in Hebrews 12, verse number 6, whom God loves, he chastises. I can remember growing up, I did things I ought not to do and my parents had to discipline us. Why did they do that? Because they loved us, because they cared for us. And had they not done that, we would have kept doing the same thing over and over again, thinking it was okay to do that. Sometimes in life, God is testing us. And God wants to see, in verse number Deut Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 and 3, God wants to see whether or not we're going to be persuaded by every word that comes out of his mouth. God wants to know where is your heart, where is your obedience in connection to what you go through in life. And then third of all, in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, God has to discipline us. Again, Job's friends had it all messed up. They thought because Job was going through all this stuff in life, they said, well, man, what did you do to upset God? And what was Job's charge to them? I'm innocent. I haven't done anything wrong. And the Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse number 9, Satan's charge to God is, well, the only reason he serves you is because you have a hedge of protection around his head. And Satan says to God, if you remove that hedge of protection, he'll curse you to your face. And so for the rest of the book, what do you find? You find Job struggling with his faith. Job 13, verse 15, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust in him. 
Job 23, verse 10, but he knoweth the way I take when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And as you continue to make your way throughout the book, the man is struggling with his faith. Man, I've been there. I'm sure all of us have been there tonight. We're struggling with our faith, and we're struggling whether or not this is some type of great thing I've done to upset God to this degree. And Job started believing in his mind, the reason all these things, well, maybe my friends are right. Maybe I am a sinner. Maybe I am a bad person. And so Job turned his attention to God and said, and God said, and Job said to God, God, I want to talk to you. And if you remember there, God asked Job a series of 70 plus questions. And the Bible says in Job 45, verse 2, Job put his hand over his mouth. Job said, God, I'm done. You're right. You're the one who has all power, and you're the one who has made and created everything. God wants to develop in us what I like to call inconvenient obedience. Oh, it's easy to trust God when things are going good, isn't it? It's easy to trust God and believe in God when we have all our bills paid, when all our family members are doing well. But can you trust God when your bills aren't paid? Can you trust God when bad things are happening? You have more bills than you have money. You have more problems than you have solutions. And God is wondering, are you going to be sustained by every word that comes out of my mouth? And so God has to break down in us this notion that we can do things by ourselves. In fact, in our society today, they constantly tell us, you have to be strong. You need to be strong. In some degree, you have to. But I don't think, as the world portrays it, I don't think God is so interested in my strength. I think God is more interested when I make him my strength. And so God is actually, I think, God is actually more impressed when I make him the center of attention and when I make him the center of my strength rather than just myself. Church, by myself, I can't do anything. But with God, according to Luke 1, verse 37, for with God, nothing is impossible. Let me ask you a question tonight. What do you do when God is the one who leads you to a dry place? In Exodus 17, and verse number 1, notice how the text actually says this. In Exodus 17, verse 1, the Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, notice this phrase, according to the commandment of the Lord. They're only following God's word. And God says, I want you to go to Rephidim. God was the one who led them to a dry place. God knew that there was not going to be any water there. So why did God lead them there? I mean, really. If God is all sufficient, and he is, if God is all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, if God is all that, why did he lead them to a place where he knew it was not going to be any water? Because God wants to see if they are going to be sustained by every word that comes out of his mouth. God wants to see whether or not their faith is as valid as they claim that it is. You see, our faith validates our belief, and our belief validates our faith. Everyone has, has faith when things are going good. But about a year and a half ago, all of our faith was tested. Here the world is going through a global pandemic. All of us are going through the same thing at the same time. Are you going to be sustained by every word that comes out of the mouth of God? Now, we have to be safe. We have to look out for ourselves, and those things are true. But we can allow our fear of what's going on in the world hinder us in our responsibilities in worshiping the God of heaven. Because there's always going to be stuff going on in the world. There's always going to be problems going on in the world. There have been problems going on in the world for 2,000 years. Before the Lord, there's always problems going on. And God wants to see in the midst of all those problems, are you going to trust me? We quote Hebrews 11 and verse 6 every Sunday. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently or that obediently seek him. We quote that verse. We believe, by, we believe that verse. For we walk by faith and not by sight. 
All things work together for good. Romans 8, verse 28. Ephesians 3, verse number 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We know those verses. We memorize those verses. We look at them every single day. But when Monday, when, 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 when Monday's crisis come knocking at your door, when you have to go to work with people who do not believe what you believe, who are not sustained or who are not anchored in the word of God as you are, when you have family members, all they want to do is drink and cuss and live a bad life. Are we going to be sustained by what the word of God has to say? Very often, we talk about prayer pressure in the terms of young people, and I understand that. Some of us adults got to work on prayer pressure, too. And so God wants to see if we're going to be sustained by every word that comes out of his mouth. Again, what do you do when God leads you to a dry place? God just doesn't want you to solve the problem. God wants you to trust him through the problem. God just doesn't want to see how strong and how capable you are at problem solving. God wants to see where's your faith in terms of you being able to trust him. Look at Exodus 17 and verse number 2. The Bible says, Wherefore the people did chat, chat or quarrel with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord your God? Verse number 2 again says, Wherefore the people did chat with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. What does it mean to test the Lord? Exodus 17, verse 2. Number one, to test him in this context is to doubt him. Second point up here is not that their doubt is not that they have a doubt of the existence of God. It is the doubt that he will provide. Church, that, 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 that really amazes me because only days before, they just walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Only days after that, God fed them with manna from heaven. And they, they have all this confirmation, all this proof as to why they should trust God, but yet they don't. And sometimes we look at the children of Israel and we say, man, how foolish were they? But if we look into the word of God like a mirror, it's easy to look at other folks and say, man, how foolish. I would have made a different decision. I would have done something differently. How dare the children of Israel doubt God? How dare they question God? How dare they not have any faith in God? But when we look at our own lives, God is constantly giving us proofs every single day as to why we should trust him, as to why we should have belief in him. As to why we should put our hope in him. First Timothy 2, as to why he should be our anchor. The, the God constantly gives us proof. He's constantly affirming to us, I can be trusted. In 1 Kings 8, verse 56, the Bible says God does not repent. Well, he doesn't need to, that is. In Titus 1, verse 2, the Bible says, in hope of eternal life, God who cannot lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18, God cannot lie. There are a lot of people we know that lie to us. Not the God in heaven. We can trust him because of his track record. We can trust God because every time God said he was going to do something, he did it. Every time God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5, Joshua 1, verse 5, every time God said those things, he delivered. Who am I not to trust God? Who am I not to believe in God? When God leads us to a dry place in our life, God wants to know if we're going to have enough faith to trust him. Are we going to have enough faith to believe in him? Again, third of all, when God leads you to a dry place, trust that God can also sustain you in that place. Church, God will never lead you to a place he can't get you out of. I think sometimes we forget that. Well, if God led me to this place, why hasn't he got me out yet? Have you learned your lesson yet is a better question. Well, if God has moved me to this place, if I'm going through all these bad things in life, you know what, God, I'm waiting on you. Come on, God, hurry up and save me. And God is still saying, you still haven't learned your lesson yet. God wants us to trust him, even when it's inconvenient, 
even when it's not going the way we think it should go. Look at the text in Exodus chapter 17 and verse number 3. Verse number 4, the Bible says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. When you read the Exodus, when you read the book of Numbers especially, it amazes me how often they wanted to stone Moses and Aaron, and these two were just doing the work of God. If you remember over in Numbers chapter 20, when they once again was thirsty, and if you remember there, they cried to Moses saying, Moses, give us something to drink. And we know at this point, Moses is pretty, he's pretty much fed up with the children of Israel. And so Moses said in response to that, must we fetch you rebels water out of this rock? And I find that so amazing because Moses is comparing himself to God. Moses said, must we, me and God, get you all water out of this rock? Moses allowed them to get, Moses allowed them to cause him to get to a point well, the Bible says Moses began striking the rock. God told Moses to speak to the rock, and Moses is over here striking the rock. And if you remember what happened, as a result of that, God said, because you disobeyed me, Moses, guess what? I'm not going to allow you to go into the promised land. Now, later on over in Deuteronomy chapter 10, after Moses has done this great work for God, Moses has a conversation with God. Moses said, God, I know you're an excellent God. I know you're a mighty God. Would you let me go into the promised land? And what did God say? God said, God, God told Moses, Moses, why are we even talking about this? I've already told you a long time ago, but God is so loving and God is so kind and God is so gracious. He still allowed Moses to see that land. He never got to go in, but he still got to see it. God wants to know will you trust him in dry places. Notice what else the text says here in Exodus 17 and verse number 5. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take it into thy hand. Verse 6 says, Behold, I will stand before thee upon th there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there come water out of it. And the people may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God tells Moses, I want you to strike the rock. Now, I don't know because I wasn't there, but I wonder as they made their way through Rephidim on their way to Sinai's mount. I often wonder what else was in that desert, point, it doesn't really matter there, but what else was in that desert God could have told Moses to use? Point, just, just kind of a just thought there. But here you have this rock, and God tells Moses, you see that rock? I want you to strike that rock, and I want you to see how water flows out of it. Now, first of all, Moses had to have enough faith in God that God was going to bring water out of a rock, even though Moses probably had never seen that before. Faith looks different to those who don't understand the word of God. And what I mean by that is in Joshua chapter 6, you have God telling his people, I want you to march around the walls of Jericho one time a day. If I'm a guard, as I always say, if I'm a guard in Jericho, I'm looking down saying, man, these people, God's people, they crazy. Why are they walking around the walls of Jericho one time every single day? But on that seventh day, guess what happened? The, the mighty walls of Jericho fell down. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse number 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Faith looks different to those who are not Christians. God gave them water out of a rock. God gave them what they needed from an unlikely place or an unlikely source. God said, here's a rock. I want you to strike the rock and watch how water flows out. I can remember being a preaching student. I'm sure many of us who were preaching students, we can remember how uh, very often we didn't have a lot of money for a lot of much of anything. But yet God always provided a way for us to have exactly what we needed. 
God always provided a person in our life, in our life, that gave us, whether it was 10 or 20, whatever it was, to help us to make it through the next week. God was able to bless us from unlikely sources. Sometimes we think God should come with all types of glamour in terms of blessing us. In fact, unfortunately, that was many of the, Jew, that, that was many of the Jews' problem. Well, surely we're going to have a king like David. He's going to sit on his throne. He's going to be so great. But it didn't happen that way, did it? And once Jesus was born into the world, once he came into the world, he grew up, and now he's teaching. And once he begins telling them, I'm the Messiah, I'm that Christ, they're looking around like, hold up, wait, we, we, we thought he was going to be like David. We thought he was going to sit on his throne like David, but the Bible tells us Christ is sitting on David's throne. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, talking about David, said Peter, I mean, David is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us. Peter said, I can go show you what David's buried, but the resurrection Savior, Peter said, if you go to his grave, guess what? His body's not in there. Matthew 28, verse number 6, as they go to the grave, he is not here, for he is risen. God gave them exactly what they needed from an unlikely, from an unlikely place. Again, God gives us what we need in those, in those dry moments in life. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Exodus 17, verse 1, God led them to Rephidim. Exodus 17, verse 2 and 3, they began chiding, they began tempting the Lord, saying, well, you know what? Go talk to God, Moses. And so Moses does that. Exodus 17, verse 5 and verse number 6, God tells Moses, strike the rock, and the Bible says water comes flowing out to them. What's the point? God will often in life lead you to a dry place. And God is asking you, are you going to be sustained by what comes out of my mouth? Are you going to believe everything I have said and I have spoken to you? Now, again, when everything is going good, man, it's good. It, it's great. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. We believe that. We trust that. When everything is going good, well, sometimes in life, everything doesn't go good. Everything doesn't go the way you expect or the way you want it to go. And in those moments, will you trust God? Again, in Exodus 17, verse 1, God was the one who led them to that place. I want to look at verse number 7 and verse number 8 with you before we close tonight. Verse number 7 again says, And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And verse 8 said, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Verse number 8 to the end of the chapter is really a different sermon in and of itself. But I want to look at verse number 8 before we close tonight. Verse number 8, it's amazing that here they are, and they just experienced this dryness. And after they finally receive the water out of the rock, here they are, another situation, and something else is at their front door still. Sometimes life doesn't give you the opportunity to get over of, of, of what you just went through. Here I am constantly proving myself, constantly showing God I'm faithful, constantly showing God I'm his, constantly showing God I'm going to trust him. Why do things keep happening? But when you read the Bible, when you read the New Testament especially, we come to the realization that life is all about tests. In school, we have to go through tests because the teacher has to know whether or not we know the material. And so sometimes in the test of life, God wants to see, do we know our material in regards to trusting him and at his word? Trusting God in dry places. Again, all of us, if we're honest with ourselves tonight, we have had a moment of dryness in our life. And the question is, are we going to be sustained by every word that comes out of the mouth of God? In Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4, the Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Trust in God in dry places. There may be some here tonight who's going through a, a tough time in life. Doesn't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But the good thing about being a Christian is, the good thing about being a child of God is, if I don't wake up tomorrow, I know I'm going to see my Lord's face. I'm going to be with my Lord, and I'm going to be with him for eternity. And that is what I'm looking forward to. But if you're not a child of God, the Bible lets us know in Luke chapter 16, uh, you need to get that right. In Luke 16, verse 19, the Bible says there was, there was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen. The Bible says he fared sumptuously every day. The text goes on to say, for the sake of time tonight, that he woke up in Hades. But Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. There's a great gulf fix. And the Bible says, send me back. I have five brothers that I might testify unto them. And Abraham said, they hear not Moses nor the prophets, neither will they be persuaded when one rose from the dead. And the amazing thing is, many of those folks we talked about this morning, they saw Christ rise from the dead, and many of them, they still didn't believe he was the Christ. They still decided to walk out and live their own lives separate and apart from Christ. But tonight, I don't want to just know Christ, I want to have a relationship with him. He's my Lord, and I want to trust him. But again, it's hard to trust someone you don't know. It's hard to have a relationship with someone you don't know. It's hard to know someone's character if you haven't talked with them. The more we spend with the Word of God, the more time we spend with the Word of God, the more our relationship grows and the more we begin to trust Him. Whatever your needs are tonight, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.